Hello and welcome to the Sydney Opera House Playhouse. My name is James Evans, I work at Bell Shakespeare and let me first acknowledge that we're here on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. It is a great privilege to tell this story on this land and I am joined here by the wonderful cast and directors of Bell Shakespeare's current production of the Scottish play. I can say Macbeth because we're doing the show. It's absolutely fine. Now, here we are uh, at the Opera House, Sydney Opera House Playhouse, coming to you live with this Q&A. And I just want to mention that this production is co-presented by our friends at the Sydney Opera House, as well as with the Arts Centre Melbourne in partnership with the Arts Centre in Melbourne. And we're going to be seen by over 12,000 students across our five-week season, which is fantastic. We'd like to say a big thank you to the Australian Government, Department of Arts and Communications, and our national schools partner, Foxtel, for their ongoing support of Bell Shakespeare's education program. Now, let me go around first of all, and if I can throw to you first, Alex, on the end there, why don't we all just introduce yourselves, say who, who you are, and which character you play in the show. Thanks. Hi, I'm Alex. I play Malcolm and the First Murderer. Hey, also perhaps um, mention, you know, a couple of uh, lines about who Malcolm is and... and, and oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. Just, just so a Malcolm bit of an is made the Prince of Cumberland very early on in the piece. Mm, old mate Mac is not super happy with that and becomes king at the end. And First Murderer is partially responsible for the death of Banquo. Hi, my name is Steph. I'm a Mardu woman and I play one of the witches. Um, I find myself with, and my two sisters in this period in time and we decide to sort of push the boundaries of the mortal world. G'day, my name's Russ. Uh, I'm a proud Nutter man and I play, uh, who do I play? Duncan, the king. Um, he's the king at the start of the play and then some bad stuff happens to him. Uh, and then I play one of the murderers. No, then I play Macduff, who um, ends up needing to try and um, help Malcolm towards the end of the show. We all know what happens now, I don't even say. Uh, and then I play the second murderer, who is actually, in fact, the murderer. <laughs> and you are the accomplice, but <laughs> that's all right. Here we go. Hello, my name's Emma. I play three characters. First of all, I play the bleeding captain, or Ross, um, who is an amalgamation of two characters in this production. Um, and he's basically a soldier who comes back to uh, feedback news from the battles. Um, then I play Lady Macbeth, who is Macbeth's better half. Um, and Lady Macduff, who is Macduff's wife. Uh, hi everybody, my name's Hugh, I'm uh, one of the co-directors. I'm Amy and I'm the other co-director. Uh, I'm Rob and I play Macbeth, uh, a soldier who gets a prophecy on the way back from returning from a battle uh, about him becoming king and it kind of eats away at him, that's what the play is about. Hi, I'm Maria, I play one of the witches and I'm the fight in movement director. Hi, my name's Felix. Uh, I play the role of Banquo, um, who also received a prophecy but just doesn't go crazy uh, because of it. Um, uh, I play, and he's also the one that gets murdered by said murderers earlier on, and Bad Time Ross, who comes and delivers some bad news towards the end, and uh, Seton at the very end, who is the only guy left helping Macbeth trying to, trying to win the war, I guess. Hi, I'm Laura and I play one of the witches um, and I'm also Fleance, who is Banquo's son. Thank you very much. That's great, guys. Now, let me jump straight into the questions here. Amy Hardingham, the director, one of the directors. Can you tell us about this set that we can see here behind us? We've got some shards here, granite-looking um, items, and, and also some wonderful projections that, uh, that are, are projected onto these set pieces. Can you tell us about the significance of the set and the technology that you use in the show? Sure. Well, very early on, um, well, I should explain... Hugh and I being co-directors is a little bit unusual. And so we started a conversation about if we could ever direct a production of Macbeth, what it would be like about a year ago. And very early on in our conversation, we talked about the witches being um, 
in essence, a force that young people in the audience would really connect with. And we talked about wanting the witches to be actually scary and impressive and for a, a modern young audience to really believe and understand that Macbeth and Banquo are, are awed by the witches. So we talked a lot about um, the use of projection and that maybe that was part of the witches' power. But we also wanted to capture the essence of the world that's in the play. Um, and the setting that's there is really strong and evocative and we wanted to bring that out as well. So rather than set it somewhere else altogether, we wondered if we could have two things happening at once. So really contemporary witches with access to technology in some way um, and this sort of ancient medieval world or that's something that had the sense of the medieval world without being um, a recreation. So we went to Tobai Fellow, who's our set and costume designer, and we... Um, just had a conversation very early on about whether that could work. You know, we wanted to know from a design, designer's point of view whether that idea could really work and what sort of language you might use to start describing it. And she helped us come up with the idea of the distilled medieval. Um, and so then when we actually started moving into production to actually making this show a reality, um, we talked a lot with Toby about the world we wanted to evoke and we looked at a lot of different images. Some of them were really ancient, such as the ancient sanding stones that you would see if you went up uh, north in Scotland. And so, and some of them were very contemporary images um, and we were interested in the idea of something kind of coming out of the landscape. And we talked to her a lot about um, that that could be cliffs or it could be a castle, that there were kind of two things going on. And so Toby came back with this design and she um, actually works very organically. Initially she just kind of got some some sort of, sort of card and just shaped these. And she just kind of did it intuitively after looking at lots of images and came back to us and we were like, yeah, that's amazing. And so, you know, we knew that they needed to work as projection surfaces as well as set pieces and that was really difficult. And she worked really, really hard with the amazing production people at Bell to find um, the right balance. Um, so these are um, flats essentially that have been scenic up and some people apparently, or oh, scenic means they've been painted and detailed and some people have said to us they think they look like fabric. Um, and in indeed, initially we really wanted them to be felt, but they ended up being painted um, and she's done the most incredible job. And then of course, as you saw in the show, there's the big reveal with the throne turning around and the beautiful mirrored interior. And um, that's really inspired by kind of natural, um, you know, when you find rocks and inside are beautiful crystals. Um, so, and Toby was also inspired by palaces such as the Palace of Versailles. So she wanted something reflective and magical inside there when that throne turns. Um, and she's done a really amazing job. Thanks, Amy. Great. Now, Hugh, uh, Hugh McKinnon, the other director, uh, you guys, as directors, uh, not only are uh, creating the show, but you're dramaturgs as well, shaping the script before the actors are in the room. What have you done to this play, Hugh McKinnon? What, what have you done? You've turned it into a 90-minute show. How did yeah, you do that? Uh, cut it to shreds. Yep. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, by virtue of, of what this show needs to be, which means it, it needs to happen uh, twice a day, um, and we're, we're performing to... Uh, uh, school students, so everything needs to be done by three o'clock in the afternoon. So you got, if you've got to do a show twice a day by three o'clock in the afternoon, it's got to be reasonably brief. Um, and we do it without an interval. So the the job was, is to get it down to uh, 90 minutes. Um, now there's some, a lot of people believe that that's something that Shakespeare would have done uh, 400 years ago when he did it, when the King's Men were putting on Macbeth for the first time, they would have made various cuts or added uh, bits in or left bits out depending on who they were performing to. So I don't think it's a particularly uh, unique thing for us to do. But it is sometimes when you're a real Shakespeare nerd, uh, it is sometimes difficult to cut all your favorite poetry. Um, and when you're trying to make a 90 minute show for a modern audience, there's a, lot of the, there's a lot of the beautiful poetry and a lot of the beautiful imagery that is first to go because you've got to keep those bits that are, are driving the narrative and getting you through the story. But Amy and I, I think tried really hard to um, find moments where we could still uh, not use the poetry so much, but bring some of that imagery to life in other things that were going on. And we, uh, scenes that would normally be cut in such a quick, quick version, there's scenes where two characters seemingly just talk about the weather for five minutes. Uh, and on, on the surface of it, that's what it is. But actually what they're really talking about is how the natural world is ref re uh, reflecting the disorder that the characters in the play have, or that some of the characters in the play have created. And so we wanted to find ways to keep um, elements of that in or little bits of that in, but repurpose them a little bit. So those of you that know the play will see that we've, we've kept um, some of those scenes and given those lines to other characters, because that's the other thing about this play. We only have uh, eight characters, uh, eight actors uh, to work with. 
so yeah, we've made um, what should we say, Jimmy? We've made we've found efficiencies in the <laughs> yeah in the script while while trying to keep as much of that beautiful poetry as possible. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Hugh. Now, Maria, let me ask you a question here. Now, you're not only playing one of the Weird Sisters, but also you are the movement and fight director. Now, in this production. I mean, usually in the Scottish play, you, you get great big broadswords and Maccas and Macduff at the end are kind of swinging them at each other. But in this production, we've chosen to go without weapons. Tell me a little bit about the fights and the decisions behind how you choreograph those fights. Yeah, sure. So with the fight scenes for this play, we're pretty much using hand-to-hand -hand combat. So while well, from the style that we've decided to utilize is uh, comes across various forms of martial arts from Brazilian Jiu Jitsu to Hapkido to Aikido to Taekwondo to, and, and there's locks and spins and grappling. And it's really fascinating to work with actors and be able to build upon the fight scenes. But the, the main thing is we don't want audiences to know where the fight scenes are going as well as there is a rhythm and a, a beat and a flow to it so that it keeps people on edge when it comes to to watching the escalation of the scenes. So I feel like it was really fun to, to work with the actors on this and to build upon the fight scenes and, and even for them to also come up with new ideas on how to be efficient with their moves or how to prolong the scene or how to even react to certain the hits and the dodges and the misses. So. Yeah. Was, it, was there training uh, during the, the process as well, strength and conditioning, that sort of thing? During yes. During the rehearsal, yeah? So every single day we would have about, you know, about half an hour to just run through the basic moves uh, from punches to kicks to spins. So every single move that was designed on stage were, was broken down and, and uh, like uh, practiced repetitively over and over again until it was finally in the system of, of like the actors. So what you see is pretty much a lot of hard work. Um, behind the scenes in and, rehearsal, and often Maria, you had the whole you had the whole cast involved in those warm ups and and uh, and learning the particular moves from the fights, not just the people that were in the fights. Yeah, yeah, and I believe that um, by doing that, it just shows how accessible these moves are, and it's even though it looks spectacular, but if we break it down, people. Um, who have never done these types of fights can actually try and give it a go and see the outcomes of it. Hmm. Great, thanks. Thank you, Maria. Emma, let me ask you a question. Lady M playing one of the iconic roles in Shakespeare. How do you play a role that everyone has an opinion about this role? How do you approach it fresh and not let those words get in your head? Yeah, sure, great question. Um, to be honest, yeah, it was quite um, a process. When I got cast, I felt so lucky to, to finally get an opportunity to portray this character. She's someone that I met back in drama school and I think as every female actor going through drama school, you meet a character like, like Lady Macbeth and go, oh my God, if only I was lucky enough to play her one day. And so when this happened, it was, uh, equal parts exciting and, and daunting <laughs> because you feel like you're playing a character that is known so well. Um, very early conversations with uh, Amy and Hugh um, were fantastic where we all agreed that she's, portray she's, she's known to be this evil woman but she's actually this grief-stricken mother whose, whose child has, has died. And uh, once I kind of tapped into that side of things, yeah, she does things that are totally awful and she, she makes decisions and she encourages Macbeth to go down the path he does because she sees opportunity for her to live a better life. Um, and I also see her as someone who, um, she has a hole in her, her heart um, due to losing her child. And so once I started looking at her from that angle, I really found a whole new way of, of approaching her, I found. Um, she's someone who I think has got an extraordinary heart as well as so much courage and strength. And as I say, she's done things that I, I can't ima ever imagine doing, but um, she's, she's, she, she sees an opportunity and goes for it. And, and that is something I really love about her actually. So, yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, what, I, what I love about your performance is, um, you know that scene where she's calling on the, the evil spirits. Mm. I really get the feeling that she's never done anything like that before, that, mm. that, that this is, this is uh, new for her and, and, and that it costs her something. That, that, yeah, that absolutely. It, that it's, really, it's really heartbreaking almost. Yeah, oh, thank you. She, yeah, I think uh, 
again, with conversations that happen between, between the three of us, um, I think it's a world that she, she believes exists out there, but as soon as she gets the letter, it's confirmed. And so she's doing something that's so dangerous, but so necessary for her because at this point in time, it's now or never. Um, the only way she and they can move forward is if she, she takes this opportunity. So it's, it's exciting and terrifying and um, yeah, it's a huge risk, obviously, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. great, thanks Emma. Thanks. Now Rob, you're someone who's had a lot to do with this play in the past. You've directed a production of it yourself, you've been in the show as, a, as another character, you played Malcolm previously, uh, but, but now playing the title role, what have you learned about the character from actually being inside the world of Macbeth in his head? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So I think, um, a bit like M, it's about finding the humanity in this character. I don't think anybody really wants to see, you know, a, a monster or anything like that. You want to see somebody struggling uh, with a journey. So I, I think what surprised me about playing it was um, his levels of anxiety, I think, is something that's really kind of... Uh, surprised me. I, I think this is a man that um, acts on something which he sort of knows he shouldn't act on. He decides to do it. He makes that leap. He makes that choice. And then it's about living with those consequences afterwards. And as soon as he's done it, he knows that, you know, it, it's a, that, that river of guilt that he has to walk through is, is going to be really hard. And so I think finding those levels of anxiety throughout the play uh, was a really unique journey for me in, in doing it this time. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I mean, Em and I had a few conversations together about what our journey was together, whether, you know, the two of us had spoken about wanting to be king beforehand, before the play even starts. You know? So before, when he hears that prophecy and one of the witches says, you know, you're going to be king, that thing of like, how do they know that? How do they know we've had that conversation? So there was a few things that we worked together mm -hmm. on as well. Um, yeah, so I think that will come some of the major kind of discoveries. Yeah. I think it's a guy that gets in over his head yeah, right. and then yeah. things get away from him and he's trying constantly trying to get control of things again but he can't mm. and that's the tragedy of the play and you know he loves lady Macbeth. i think one mm. of the big tragedies of the play is that uh, the, the way they stop communicating the way that that, that he, he cut he shuts her out I, mm -hmm. I think there's just that heartbreaking scene where he says be innocent of the knowledge mm. dearest chuck, chuck till thou applaud mm -hmm. the deed do you what 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 in your conversations the two of you about the characters what what did you what did you talk about in terms of their their history their background mm. have they had they talked about the child much uh, the the death of the child yeah. much because lady macbeth drops a big clangor in the middle of that mm. act 1 scene 7 i have given suck had they talked about that before yeah great question so i mean i i don't think probably much i mean i think it was a time where a lot of that stuff was buried you know and so when she pulls that card out it's a massive card to play i remember someone once telling me about this this play that you know it's almost about these two people that are on this journey to a destination and the tragedy of the play is just as they're about to get to the destination they just miss each other yeah. you know and i yeah. think that's really true about um lady Macbeth and Macbeth's journey yeah and um, that's what in our in our early conversations uh before we started rehearsals um that was one of the big discoveries for me actually of of going, okay, so they've been this team, you know, they've been such a unit. And then in exactly that moment that you mentioned just before, James, um, when he finally, well, he, he suddenly goes, you're not included in my plan anymore. For her, that is just so devastating because even though they've done all these awful things together um, out of necessity, <laughs> when he turns her back on her, she's so alone in the world, uh, like really alone and alone with, the guilt and the uh, everything comes flooding <laughs> back to her. You know, the guilt and the, her conscience kicks in. But um, yeah, that that's it's a it's yeah it's an incredible journey. I think between the two of them. Really interesting thing about Macbeth too is that he doesn't talk very much at the beginning of the play. Mm. You know, all the scenes with Lady Macbeth are started, so one word answers, you know, or one sentence, blah, blah, or yeah. even even with Banquo, he doesn't talk much. Banquo does a lot of the talking in those scenes, and then after he's done the deed, it's like he can't he can't shut up. <laughs> you know, and so oh, I think know. that's a really, a really big <laughs> clue to Shakespeare, that Shakespeare's giving the actor playing mm. Macbeth there about, you know, um, what's this character going through. And yeah, that's yeah. a great insight. Thanks, Rob. Um, Alex, let me ask you a question up the end there. Uh, you spent, 
a, a year last year with the players at Bell Shakespeare's in school touring ensemble. You've had a lot to do with Shakespeare's language and, to, uh, and with young audiences as well. What is your approach to Shakespeare's language? What do you say to a kid who looks at it on the page and says, oh, this is too hard for me, I, 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 can't, I, I can't figure this out? I think, um, I think probably one of the biggest things that I remember is that if you don't get it the first time you read it, if you find it really hard, that's not a comment on your own intelligence. That doesn't mean you're dumb. Um, I've certainly read stuff before by Shakespeare and been like, what? Where's the, what? Uh, there's a clip on YouTube. It's of a group of Shakespearean actors and they're like the huge big wigs, like old mate who played Gandalf, um, Ian McKellen and all that. Uh, and they're kind of, gathered around a table like looking at a text and they're reading it and then suddenly they kind of get really confused as to what's happening and they pull up their like specialized Shakespeare dictionaries and they're picking it apart and like these people who are at the top of their game uh kind of get lost in it as well so like for anyone that picks it up and is like this just feels like this massive wall of words I don't get what's going on then I, I think the first thing to do is just be like that doesn't mean you're dumb um yeah uh, from there, because there's so much more, um, I think, you know, Hugh says this a lot in the, in the work I've done with him. It's, it's actually about getting it up and moving it. Um, this is a great uh, phrase that old mate uses, Hugh, um, blueprints in space. Shakespeare wrote these things. Uh, and although, like, you know, the culture was a lot of listening, uh, which is very different to us. We're very visual these days with TV and all that. Um, but the, the plays were made to be seen. They were made to be watched. They were made to be viewed. And the same way, if you investigate it just by sitting down and just reading it, you're kind of stacking the odds against you. You want to be getting up and moving it around and seeing what happens when one character sits still the whole time. What happens when one character runs around a whole lot. Just like, just really encouraging play with it and taking away the thought that it has to be this dusty old manuscript that a dude with a beard and a frill this big wrote hundreds of years ago, I think is, is the, is the key thing. Um, right. yeah. yeah. And, and then to sort of start, you know, there's, there's a lot of imagery that we've, we've kind of chatted about and you saw the show, like he, Shakespeare goes on a lot about these massive pictures that he builds with words that are about these incredibly huge stakes of heaven and hell and life and death. And just these, these things that are enormous, um, and I think to, to kind of be brave in that and to have fun in dipping into these things that we're not always ready to talk about, but that are, affect all of us and to start kind of unpacking those pictures and personalizing what they mean to you rather than it just being like, oh, I don't know what's going on. And then, sorry, I'm rambling. I'll be real quick with this last bit. Um, I know some other people in the cast did this as well. I'd really encourage um, finding a way to voice it in your own words. Uh, just for just to be specific about what's going on if you can take a Shakespeare text and sit down and pick it to pieces and be like this is what the character is saying and write it as you would say it uh, I know there's some fantastic resources online that do that for you that can be a great entryway into making this pretty complicated language much 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 more accessible than just a 400 year old dictionary Great. Thank you so much, Alex. That's great. Now, uh, Laura, let me ask you something about the weird sisters. Now, mm -hmm. remember uh, that the word witch is only used once in this play, and I think you might have cut it out, actually. It's, it's when, when one of the sisters is talking about what someone else has called her, right? Yeah, she gets upset. Yeah, and she, gets upset and she says, uh, she, she called me witch. Uh, but, but they call themselves the weird sisters. Now, is it the weird sisters' fault? that all this stuff goes down? Is it their fault or is it Macbeth's fault or Lady Macbeth's fault? What is the role of the Weird Sisters in this whole world falling apart? Oh, well, talking about assigning blame, I think you can uh, do that on any level. You could say it's Macbeth's fault because he actually does the murder. It could be Lady Macbeth's because when he turns away from it, she says, no, do it. It could be the witches because they lay the prophecy there for him. But I think it, uh, when you're looking at it like that, it becomes about the societal expectations in order to get that uh, role of king, which is, uh, you know, prized by so many, society has put that in a position of desire and then with the little triggers it gets there. So th I think the Weird Sisters, they spark a flame. They're the catalyst for the idea of um, pursuing, you know, uh, your dream. However, you might have to get there in his case. It's murder. Um, <laughs> kids don't murder people. Um, but it's, I think, 
uh, uh, the Weird Sisters aren't to blame, I don't think. I think they're actually a very good function as a way of showing how little it takes in order to for something quite dark to happen. It can be a very small catalyst, and I think they are there to function as a sort of a reminder of conscience in a way. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Laura. Uh, now, Felix, you play Banquo uh, as well as a number of other characters, but I reckon the best thing about playing Banquo is doing ghost acting. Yeah, yeah. always now, wanted to do it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing. Now, yeah. so many different ways that you can interpret playing <laughs> the ghost of Banquo. How do you approach the role of a ghost? Um, I just try to be as invisible as possible. <laughs> <laughs> by walking slowly and not making any noise. Um, no, it's kind of cool. Like, I, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting moment, and it's one that I didn't really think about too much. And then as I've, uh, throughout rehearsal, thinking about what I was actually going to be doing. So, you know, I, it, Banquo in our version, he kind of gets killed, as you saw, uh, murdered by the murderers, and then um, slowly rises and walks off. And that journey from that point, for me, is... What, I, what is driving Banquo throughout the play and what is he still seeking as a ghost? I know that that's probably not what um, perhaps is intended, or, but for me, I had to try to work out why is Banquo still here? Because he is still here. It might be a, it might be a figment of Macbeth's imagination, but for all intents and purposes and for this production, uh, Banquo is here. So what does he want? So um, you always have to work out what you want. As you, what, what does your character want? So... I've been thinking about it in terms of he 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 does he is ambitious Banquo. I think he is ambitious. I think he he got told that his children are going to be king. He's not going to be as happy as Macbeth, but he's going to be happier. That was kind of a strange thing, but that his children will be king and and he never says anything. He never dobs in on Macbeth. He 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 questions whether Macbeth did it. He he's pretty sure that he killed King Duncan because he says I feared thou played some most foully for it. Um but he never says tells anyone and so there could there could be a production there could be a world where Banquo they have a conversation and Banquo goes dude I know like it's cool <laughs> maybe you know I'm not saying but so in my in my head when he comes back as the ghost he he's he's he wants the crown and and he's dreaming of what what that will be for his kids because he's not going to get to see it and it might not be his child it might not be Flounce it might be Flounce's child or Flounce's grandchild or you know, it could be down the line, but he's dreaming of this prophecy that the witches did give to him, even though he had to ask for the prophecy. He was given a prophecy that his children would be king, and it's, and it's um, even though he might not 100% believe it, that's probably a big difference between him and Macbeth. He might not 100% buy in, he might only 50% buy in, or even 20% buy in, but it's, a, it's there, and he's thinking about it all the time, so he wants to get that crown. So I think that's why when we started building in the where the ghost would walk throughout that banquet scene, it was, for me, it was less about scaring Macbeth and being there to get vengeance on Macbeth. It was more about trying to see where, where the end was and if the prophecy was true and if, if Banquo's children would, were ever going get, to get their hand on that crown. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and of course he does appear in the, uh, in the apparitions as well, yeah, doesn't he? Um, which, is, uh, which Macbeth sees, yeah? That's right. I was just going to say on the ghost as well. I think it's an interesting, always an interesting topic for a class that, that's studying the play, you know, I mean... <clears throat> there's a couple of things that Macbeth sees throughout this play. One is a dagger, which we don't see, and then there is the ghost, which, you know, we do see as an audience, you know, and, and why is that? Why does that happen? It's not like Hamlet, where other people see this ghost as well, you know, just Macbeth sees this ghost. So why is Shakespeare done it? It's always a great talking point for yep. a classroom to jump Absolutely, off absolutely. Uh, now, Russell, let me ask you a question. So you played two characters in this show, well, three actually, but 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 uh, two main characters. One is the king at the start, the high top status character, and then you play the revenging hero, Macduff, at the end, and of course a murderer in between as well. How do you, as an actor, work on differentiating those characters? How do you, in the rehearsal room, find differences between those characters and, and bring them out, physically or vocally, however it may be? Uh, I think it's, again, it kind of comes down to what Felix was saying and that is what is the objective and what is the objective of each character within it and you start with their intention and the realness of wherever that character is. Um, and for me, each one of them had to have something clear in the moment with that it is that they want. And even in playing um, one of the murderers was actually giving the character a backstory and going... 
what is it, you know, if he actually does kill Banquo, what is the reward and how is the reward going to um, serve him in the future? For me, that really, really helps. Costumes are an amazing thing. Yeah, when, <laughs> <laughs> when someone gives you a crown, you just, yeah, it's an amazing thing. You put that on your head and you are therefore king. Um, that really helps. I don't know. I mean, it just, it varies. It really does vary, like, in production to production where... Uh, I know that we've worked together before and one of my other ways into characters was just using, like, going through voice and, and exploring that. Um, it really does vary, but for this one in particular, for me, it was just the clear intentions and the stakes at hand. I think Macduff's uh, stakes at the time, you know, they, they build as it goes on and the king is coming in actually high stakes where a battle has taken place, but... And what has actually happened. Um, uh, and I mean, stakes are always high, but then it's also, I think, as well for him, it's enjoying the moment and making sure everyone is happy and, you know, everything's going to be wonderful after this without actually, with the naivety of, you know, making my son the heir to the yeah. throne, you know, and, and that's the story. But um, yeah. Yeah. Russ also, um, to get into. King Duncan, <laughs> 10 minutes before the show, he puts on his costume and uh, once that crown goes on, he walks into everyone's uh, dressing room and says, I'm king, I'm king, call me king, king's call here. me king. King's here. That's actually true. He says, king's here, king's here. Amazing, amazing. Well, such a big part of it is uh, others endowing you as the character, aren't they? Which, yeah. as the bleeding captain, I have to say, I yeah. bow every time I see him back. As soon as I've got my full costume on You're for down. bleeding captain and he's got that crown on <laughs> and he announces that he's king, you it's just to. bowing you all the way to. through the dressing rooms. <laughs> now, I've got one more question. I've got one more question to ask here, and we've just about uh, time to wrap this up. Steph, let me ask you this play, and it, and it brought a question about the play. It, it was written in 1606. Here we are, 413 uh, years later. Why is it that this play still resonates? Why are we still doing it year after year, generation after generation? What is it about the Scottish play? Well... <laughs> <laughs> In two uh, well, it's a play that's about ambition and betrayal, uh, grief, and those are things that people have been dealing with since the beginning of time, and there'll be things that we deal with until the end of time. But it's a play full of political turmoil, and it talks a lot about how we as humans react and respond to that. I think we live in politically tumultuous times and so the play is more relevant now than ever. Um, but I should also say, uh, before doing this play, I thought I had a really good understanding of Macbeth and what it was about and the characters in it and what they wanted. Um, and it turns out I hadn't even scratched the surface of it. Um, and I think every time this play is put on, it reveals another part of itself to the audience. And I think we'll continue to put the play on until we've discovered all we have to discover um, and until it doesn't speak to us anymore, which I think will be in probably another 400 years. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, I just want to thank the entire cast of Macbeth. I want to thank Amy and Hugh, the directors, and thank you for tuning in and listening. And I hope you enjoyed the show. I'm sure you did. It was a cracking performance of Macbeth today. Thank you so much, guys, and we hope to see you around the theatre really soon. Goodbye.